Uh, last time we met, we covered chapter six, chemical reactions, and learned how to balance chemical equations. And so we talked about the symbols that you learn for the elements, that's like the alphabet, and then the compounds and naming compounds, those are the words, and then the chemical reactions, the way we set the chemical reactions up, those are sentences. And they describe what's happening when you observe a chemical change. Today, we're going to look at uh, some more chemical reactions, but these are going to be specific to aqueous solutions. <clears throat> and we're going to finish this chapter, and this is the, the last chapter. Chapter 6 and 7 are for exam 4. Exam 4. So, um, this is Tuesday the 20th. On Thursday the 22nd, I will not be here. Um, I have, I'm obliged to attend a mandatory training for the college. So we will not meet on the 22nd. Fortunately, that's a buffer day. Uh, when we come back a week from today, on the 27th, we'll review the material for exam four, in right? chapter six, and chapter seven. All right, so let's get started on this. Um, the chemical reactions, <clears throat> predicting whether a reaction will occur is um, something the chemists have been trying to do for centuries. And they've been reasonably, reasonably successful um, using different methods. We're going to use the simplest form of method, trying to observe what drives the chemical reaction and then uh, predicting whether it will occur. Uh, we'll also look at um, various types of chemical reactions that occur in water and um, actually predict the products for um, two types of chemical reactions. This one, the acid-base acid chemical reaction, you can predict the outcome. And for precipitation reactions, which we'll describe in a few minutes, you can also uh, predict the outcome for many of those reactions. So let's move along here. There are basically four driving forces that we have identified that uh, forces a chemical reaction to proceed. Number one is the formation of a solid. When a solid is formed, right? when a solid is formed, we call it a precipitate. So you put two solutions together, and by solution, I mean homogeneous mixtures, and you can shine a light through them, and you don't see the light beam in the solution. Um, and when you combine them, they react to form at least one solid, usually just one solid. And that precipitation is, um, think of it as uh, raining. When we say it's, it's raining outside, it's precipitating, or it's snowing, that's precipitation. In chemistry, a precipitation is a solid, and it falls out of solution. Right? If you wait long enough, the solid will collect on the bottom of your container. The second driving force is the formation of water. Right? The formation of water often drives a reaction. And it's not exclusive to acid-base reactions, but it's... Uh, one of the defining characteristics of an acid-base reaction. When you, when you put an acid together with a base, right? we know how to write those compounds. The acid has at least one hydrogen and then something else, and a base usually has something and then a hydroxyl. But when you combine those together, one of the products is water. 
And the since these occur in aqueous solution, that water becomes part of the solvent. And the, the driving force for the formation of water is very strong. Uh, so uh, the formation of water will cause a reaction to occur. Transfer of electrons is another one. Okay, so if you if you transfer an electron from uh, uh, one atom to another atom, that also tends to drive a reaction. Now, sometimes electrons won't transfer this direction. They prefer to go that direction, in which case the reaction won't occur. But if there's a transfer of electrons, the reaction will occur in one direction or the other. Formation of a gas <clears throat> is also a driving force for a reaction. <clears throat> Think about it this way. When you put two chemicals together, and we're going to reference these in terms of aqueous solutions. When we put two solutions together and a gas is formed, right? It rises out of the solution. And that removes the gas from the environment, the reaction environment. So if you have, uh, if you have, say, uh, uh, A plus B yields C plus D, and D is a gas, right? And then think of it this way, right? When you have A and B in here, and they produce C and D, D rises as a gas, and what does it do? It leaves the environment. So what it's doing is it's driving the reaction toward the D because you're removing the D, and uh, the reaction wants to produce enough D so that there's a balance. We call that equilibrium. And if you remove the D, then the, the it keeps trying to make more D to acquire that balance. But it can because the gas is, is going. The only time the gas will stop is when you run out of reactants. Right? If, a, if a limiting reactant is exhausted, then the reaction stops. But until that time, if you produce a gas, the driving force will uh, it, of the formation of the gas is the driving force that will cause the reaction to proceed. Okay, I've got a little video here which focuses on uh, solid formation. So in the reactions we've seen so far then, we mix chemicals together and we know that a reaction has taken place because we get a change of colour. But there are lots of other ways that a chemical reaction can show up. And one way is called a change of state. So the state of something just means whether it's a solid or liquid or a gas. So if something turns from a solid to a liquid or from a gas to a solid, then it's changed state. So let me show you an example of a chemical reaction that involves a change of state. So I'm going to use these two liquids. I have a red liquid and a colourless liquid. What I'm going to do is to pour the colourless liquid onto the red liquid very carefully and try to make two layers. So what I want to happen is for the colourless liquid to be floating on top of the red liquid in, in separate layers so that they don't mix. Okay, so I think that's worked quite well. So what I've got now is one liquid floating on top of another and where they meet they undergo a chemical reaction and they're actually making a solid. A solid material is formed where the two liquids meet. And what I can do is to fetch out some of this solid material and as I pull it out of the beaker of course it allows the two liquids to meet each other again and so they react again to form more of this solid. So if I'm careful So as I wind, I'm pulling up this material and it allows the two liquids to meet again and it forms more of this material. And this substance that's being formed is actually nylon. So we're making nylon as I speak. And if I'm careful, I'd be able to just keep on turning this and making this long thread of nylon, at least until we run out of solutions. 
Okay, so that's an example then of a chemical reaction that involves a change of state. So let's have a look at another reaction that involves a change of state. And for this, I'd like a volunteer, please. Who would like to volunteer? <laughs> You're very keen. Come on down. Let's have a big hand for our volunteer. <laughs> Who would like to stand there? Let's pop those on. What's your name? Dylan. Dylan. All right, Dylan, if you stand just there, we're going to do some chemistry and we're going to make it a solid. All right, I'm going to start off with a flask that contains a solution of silver nitrate. And I'm going to add a little bit of ammonia. Now, when I add the ammonia, you see that it's forming a sort of brown colour. I'm going to keep on adding the ammonia. And in a minute, that brown colour should disappear. There we are, it's disappeared, isn't it? Now what I'm going to do is to add some sodium hydroxide. That's now formed a sort of very dark brown, almost a black material. So I'm now going to add more ammonia. And again, I'm going to add ammonia until the liquid goes back to being colourless. This takes a moment or two. There we go. And then finally, I'm going to add some glucose. So there's the glucose. Now I'm going to put the lid on, put a clip on. I'm going to give it to you, Dylan, and I want you to hold that. And I want you to give it a really good shake. That's it. Really hard shake. That's good. That's it. Keep shaking. That's it. So what's happening inside this flask now is there is a chemical reaction taking place and it's forming a solid. And the actual material that it's forming is silver. We're making pure silver metal. Keep shaking. <laughs> it takes about three quarters of an hour. Is that OK? <laughs> it, it does actually take a minute or two, but the harder you shake, the better it works. So keep shaking. Don't drop it, though. OK. <laughs> so metal, silver metal is being formed sort of atom by atom. And you can see it's all going quite black. That's because very finely divided silver is actually black in colour. What we're hoping is going to happen over the next minute or so is that those particles of silver will start to stick to the walls of the, of the flask. And as they build up, we should see uh, silver metal and in the form of a mirror building up on the inside of the flask. And uh, you'll all have seen those sort of decorations that you get at Christmas, those spheres that are shiny, and they're made using this chemical reaction, the little balls of glass and the inside is coated with silver using this kind of chemistry. Doing really well. Okay, let's have a quick look. Almost there. Keep going a little bit longer. Still looking a little bit dark. <laughs> Excellent. All right. Give it back to me then. Right, so I'm going to take the clip off. Take out the stopper. Just wash that off. And I'm going to pour out the remaining chemicals. And then I'm going to rinse this out with uh, distilled water. I'm going to rinse it out a second time. Rinse it out a third time. There we go. And I'm just going to put the that on. Let's dry this off. And put the clip back on. And if you'd like to just, just give that a little polish. There we go. If you'd like to hold it up by the neck, that's it. And if we bring a camera in and have a look at this, and we've got a, a lovely silver mirror. There we go. <laughs> okay, just stand there. OK, what I'm going to do is give that to you as a souvenir to take home, and you can go back to your seat. Let's have a hand for our volunteer. OK, so that's an example of a chemical reaction that produces a change of state. I want to show you another example of a chemical reaction. Again, this is going to go from being a liquid to being a solid. So in this flask, I have a solution of sodium acetate. And this sodium acetate is a liquid, as you can see, but it would very much like to be a solid. It would like to turn into a crystal. But it needs a sort of an excuse to get going. And the excuse is going to be some little crystals of solid sodium acetate in this dish. So watch what happens as I pour the liquid onto the crystals. So I think you can see there the liquid 
As soon as it touches the crystals, it's turning into a solid. And with a bit of luck, we can make a sort of chemical sculpture. Seems to be working. Okay, so that's a sort of sodium acetate sculpture. Now, oddly enough, this actually has a practical application, and this is the practical application. This is something called a hand warmer, and it's a plastic pouch, and it contains exactly the same liquid as in this flask. It's a solution of sodium acetate, and it would like to turn into a solid, would like to turn into a crystal, but it needs an excuse to get going. And the excuse is this little metal disc, and if I just flip this disc backwards and forwards, that should be enough just to start the crystallization off, and there it is. And we can see the liquid turning into a solid. And as it does so, it's, it's actually getting warm. So it's actually giving off heat. And there it is, it's turned entirely into uh, crystals. It's become quite warm in the process. I can put that inside my glove and keep my hands warm for half an hour or so. And then I can take this and put it into boiling water for a couple of minutes. The crystals will turn back into a liquid. I can allow it to cool and they'll stay as a liquid. And it'll stay like that for weeks or months until I'm ready to use it again. We can use it thousands of times. Okay, so that's sodium acetate, a sort of chemical sculpture. I'm going to show you now another way to make a chemical sculpture. And Chris has been preparing this. This beaker contains a mixture of para nitroacetanilide and sulfuric acid. And Chris has been warming it up. And when it's hot enough, it will undergo a reaction in which this liquid will turn into a solid. This makes quite a bit of smoke, so we've got this special hood that will suck away the smoke from the reaction. Okay, here it goes. <laughs> okay, so that's a chemical reaction that involves a change of state. So we All right. So, <clears throat> these changes of state, uh, this one in particular called precipitation, is being demonstrated here when we combine the yellow liquid and the clear liquid, and the chemical reaction produces a solid. Now this, these reactions uh, can be described using uh, our chemical reaction uh, formula, our, our equations. That, that solid is a precipitate. And here's another, uh, this, Video is going to show you the formation of a solid, and it's going to actually tell you what the reactants are. What I have here is two Erlenmeyer flasks. One has lead nitrate solids in the bottom, and one has potassium iodide solid, or salts, on the bottom. I'm going to make a solution, an aqueous solution with these. So I'm going to make aqueous lead nitrate here. mixing, you can see that it makes a solution, and it does dissolve. It is definitely aqueous. And same thing with the potassium iodide. Hopefully it will make as much of a mess. This is the Ki, adding some water, also making an aqueous solution, and both of these solutions or both of these salts are soluble in water. So they stir, and I have two aqueous solutions. You can see through them, and you can see the solids are now been dissolved. Okay. Now, interesting enough, lead nitrate is made of the nitrate ion. The nitrate ion is NO3 minus 1, and anything combined with a nitrate ion is soluble because the nitrate ion, NO3, is four atoms stretch and you have a negative um, a negative one stretched over four atoms so its charge density is very low so it doesn't attract 
other ions in a crystal as strong as uh, others. So its lattice energy is lower, and it's easy for water to pull apart the ion and have those molecule ion attractions that make this a possibility. Same thing with Ki. You have potassium iodide, and you have uh, uh, you have Ki ions that are free in this aqueous solution, and the K is plus one. The plus one ions are a big ion, and they are spectators for most types of reactions because they have a plus one over a large area as well. And the iodine, like most halides, are also soluble because they're a negative one. It's also a big ion. There's ex some exceptions with those, and we're going to see that one right here. So I'm going to pour, pour these together and take two aqueous solutions and see if a precipitate results. Now, precipitate is when a solid comes out of the solution because we're going to do a double replacement or something called a metathesis reaction. Lead plus two from this beaker is going to attract and hook up with the iodine ion to make PBI2 or lead 2 iodide. And that is going to create a precipitate because the lead iodine prefers itself more or attract itself more than water. So let's do that. Here we go. Very brilliant reaction. And you see that is pretty, very pretty yellow precipitates. A lot of ye yellow leads, lead paints, have been known to be yellow. And also a problem. So there you go, and there's your precipitate. And it's a precipitate because I know that I cannot see through the solution anymore. And if we let this settle for a while, we'll get something like this. This is a reaction I did a, about an hour or so ago. And you can see here that the clear solution is the, is the potassium nitrate ions, or the potassium and nitrate ions, and the solids are at the bottom. That's settled at the, the bottom. All right? So there is your precipitating reaction. All right. So let's talk about solutions and uh, the, the solvent in the reactions that we're investigating in this particular chapter is water. Water is often described as a universal solvent. Uh, that's not quite accurate. Water won't dissolve everything, but it dissolves many things. And it dissolves them to varying degrees. Some things are, are very soluble in water, like uh, table salt, table sugar is, is so soluble in water that if you keep adding sugar to your solution, Eventually, you'll have more sugar in there than you do water, and it's still in solution. Water dissolves many things because it's a polar molecule. Now, the description, um, I don't think we've talked about polarity yet, but think of polar as a magnet. A magnet has a north and a south pole. And if you bring it close to another magnet uh, that has the North Pole on this end, then you will get an attraction between the two. But if you, if you uh, approach with the wrong orientation, you get a repulsion. And we can think of that... Uh, polarity for uh, molecules and how they interact with one another. But we don't think of it in terms of magnetism. We think of it in terms of electrical charge or partial distribution of electron density. So what I'm saying is if water is a polar molecule, it's shaped like this, right? And the bonds between those two atoms, uh, this is a, uh, a covalent bond. So we're sharing electrons, but we're not sharing them equally. Oxygen has a greater pull on the uh, electrons. So we give it a symbol like this 
to show the direction that the electrons tend to move. And the electrons are going to spend more time around the oxygen and give it a slight negative charge. I use that small delta, the Greek delta with a negative, to show a, a slight charge. It's not a complete charge, not like, not like an ion. Not like an ion like that. It's only slight. And that means that this side is going to be positive. Okay? So when two water molecules approach one another, they will be attracted only if the oxygen of other molecule okay, is in proximity to one of the positives. And then you form that attraction. Well, the same thing can happen with between water as a solvent and different solutes. If the solutes are polar, then they'll have an orientation that attracts them to the water molecule, and they'll be more likely to dissolve in aqueous solution. Right? So there's an artist rendition of, um, um, this is called a space filling model. Right? It shows tries to show you actually the region of space occupied by each of the atoms. So oxygen's red, hydrogen is, is white. And this unequal distribution of electrical charge gives the oxygen side a negative charge. And overall, right, if we take this molecule overall, we find that it has a polarity toward the oxygen side. Uh, the negative polarity toward the oxygen side. All right. So water is, is quite capable of breaking apart ionic compounds. Uh, many of them, not all of them, but many of them. Uh, sodium chloride is a good example. Right? You put sodium chloride crystals in water and pretty soon they disappear. They have gone into solution by the sodium and the chloride breaking apart and being surrounded by water molecules. That's called the uh, hydration. All right. And here's an animation of what would might happen. Remember, if you, if you look at a uh, sodium chloride crystal under a microscope, or a magnifying glass, you see little cubes. Little cubes because of the way the ions arrange themselves in, in space. All right, so the sodiums are positive. That means the negative side of the water molecule is going to be attracted to the sodium and remove it. And when it does, it opens up a fresh space. In this case, it opens up a chloride ion. Now the water molecules approach with the positive side toward the chloride and remove it. And this process continues until there's no more solid left. Or the other possibility is the, you put so much salt in there, the solution becomes saturated. And at that point, uh, the water cannot pull any more um, ions off of the crystal without putting some back in, to replace them. Okay. So when we have an ionic compound dissolved in water, one of the evidences is <coughs> that there are ions in solution is now the water, the solution, will conduct electricity. You know, pure water is an insulator. It will not conduct electricity at low voltage. Now, if you get high enough voltage, you can ionize the water molecule and then it'll conduct. So that's why they say, you know, in a... In a thunderstorm, don't stand in a puddle of water outside. It takes a lot of voltage to ionize water, but at low voltage, water is an insulator, and that light bulb will not light. But if you put um, ions in solution, now you have a way for the current to transfer from one electrode to the other, and you complete the circuit, and the light bulb will turn on. Um, I will say also that sodium chloride solid is an insulator, an electrical insulator, because those ions are locked in place. 
they can't move. So if you try to, uh, to uh, drive a current through them, they, it won't go because the ions cannot transfer the charge from one electrode to the other. Now, if you get uh, this concept of electrolyte, an electrolyte is an ion. And if you have uh, blood work done or you have urinalysis done for your doctor, um, several of the analytical results will include electrolytes. It'll include sodium, right? sodium in your blood or urine, chloride, potassium, calcium, uh, even magnesium. Um, and there are several others that are possible. Some of them are polyatomic ions. But these ions are known as electrolytes because when they're in solution, they will conduct electricity from one electrode to the other and complete a circuit. Now, from a chemical standpoint, if the compound uh, from which the electrolyte is, is derived is completely soluble in water, we call that a strong electrolyte because it, it very efficiently conducts electricity because it dissociates into free ions. Um, all right, I was going to make the contrast between a strong and a weak electrolyte. A weak electrolyte is a compound that dissociates only partially in aqueous solution. It may go into solution, but it only dissociates partly. That is, it only produces small numbers of ions to conduct electricity. So that's a weak electrolyte. Uh, here's an example of a chemical reaction that will produce a solid. So we have, if we write the, the uh, equation in, um, with the intact formulas, then we have potassium chromate in aqueous solution. It is completely soluble. And then in a separate solution, we have barium nitrate. Right? This is aqueous. Okay. Then when we put these two together, they have the opportunity to interact, to react. And the reason they can react is because this formula is not reality. This is convenient. What is actually happening is in when you put this in solution, you get potassium ions in solution and chromate ions in solution and then barium ions in solution and then nitrate ions in solution. All these ions are in solution and they, they are able to interact with one another. So who's going to interact with who? Well, the cations, the positive ions, are going to interact with the negative ions, the anions. Right? We already know that when these two are in solution, uh, and they, they don't uh, associate strongly enough to form a solid and drop out of solution. So this potassium then would interact with that nitrate. And what do you get? Well, potassium nitrate is completely soluble, right? So you still have the two potassium ions and the two nitrate ions in solution. But when we interact this, we let this cation interact with that anion, what you get is a solid. And that's your precipitate. It will drop out of solution. Let's see, is it on the next slide? Right. This shows you the interaction of ions. Once they're in solution, uh, 
all the cations and all the anions can interact. And all we have to do is figure out which one is the solid. I have um, I've prepared, actually it's it's already been prepared, but I've made copies of a uh, of a chart that will help you determine which compounds, possible compounds from a, an interaction like this are insoluble and which are soluble. Okay. As a separate document, the chart looks like this. You'll see all the gray squares. You'll also see across the top are the cations. All the cations that are part of this chart are across the top, and down the left left hand side are the anions. So all you have to do is say, all right, if I'm going to interact barium with chromate, you just go over here and find barium wherever it is. Uh, let's see, barium's right here, and you follow it down until you find chromate all the way at the bottom, and you have a gray square. That means that it's insoluble in aqueous solution. Well, it's, it's not a solution, actually. If it, if it forms a solid, it's not, a, it's not in solution. But that's there are rules that go along with this, and they're at the bottom, but... Um, I prepared this chart, it's easier to use. So just use the chart. And I think it's also uh, part of the review document. Let me verify that. So this, this is the review document for chapter six and seven. It's in Brightspace. And yes, the chart is also in the review document. Okay. So like I've always said, if this useful information at the back of the review document, once you see that, you know that it's going to be available for the, the exam on this material. You just have to print a copy of it before you start the exam because once you get into Lockdown Browser, it won't let you access any external uh, folders or files. All right. So this is one of those type of reactions where you can predict the outcome. All right. You have this ionic compound in solution, this ionic compound in solution. You know it separates into these separate ions, some of them polyatomic. And then you just uh, do a double replacement reaction. You just swap these. Take the barium over here and the potassium over here. And what do you have? Potassium nitrate, look it up in your chart. It's completely soluble. Look up barium chromate in your chart. It's not soluble. It will form the precipitate. Then you can write the overall reaction like this. Potassium nitrate is aqueous solution, and there should be two of these. And then barium chromate is a solid. Okay? So that completes the what we call the molecular equation or the formula equation. All right. So um, these slides are just um, another way of expressing what I've already told you. You've got a reactant there, potassium chromate, barium nitrate, a reactants and they're both soluble. And then you look at the possible combinations. Potassium chromate, uh, let's see. Uh, no, potassium nitrate as a consequence of potassium and nitrate interacting and barium chromate as a consequence of barium and chromate interacting. And you see which one is a solid. Well, potassium nitrate, if it's not in solution, is a white solid, but it is completely soluble in aqueous uh, medium. Whereas barium chromate does drop out of solution and it manifests itself as a yellow solid, eventually on the bottom of your container. Okay. I mentioned those rules. 
that determine what's soluble and what's not soluble. And I don't expect you to memorize these because you're not, most of you, I understand, are not going to be chemists. You just need chemistry to help you with your program. So rather than memorize these, the chart is based upon these rules. All right? And the rules are set up so that if there's a tie, if you have uh, one rule applying to your, your uh, reaction and another applying to your reaction, the one above takes precedence. So that being said, uh, if you have um, a nitrate compound, they're soluble. If you have a, uh, a sodium or potassium compound or an ammonium compound, they're soluble and so forth. So these are all the rules, and I just put them there for your uh, interest if you want to uh, take a look at them. But this is the chart you're going to be using. Right? You have the cations across the top, anions down the left. Most of these anions are polyatomic. And all you have to do is, is match up the cation with the anion and find out what is that square. Is it clear? Is it grayed out? If it's clear, you've got a soluble compound. If it's grayed out, you have a precipitate. All right. Um, this is based upon rules. Now, for our purposes, there's, there's always a gray area. When we say soluble, uh, say this is insoluble, we say that's insoluble, that means most of the barium chromate is going to be solid. But as a matter of fact, some of it actually goes into solution. Very, very, very small amount. So most insoluble solids are actually slightly soluble. But for our purposes, um, we're going to black and white. It's either soluble or it's not soluble. Okay, these are just steps for predicting the production of precipitate, and we've already gone through them. You write the compounds in aqueous solution, and then you swap the cations, and you look at the products. Potassium nitrate is soluble. Barium chromate is not soluble based upon your chart. It's as simple as that. It's a double replacement reaction. All right. So let's take this example. Which of the following ions forms compounds with lead that are generally soluble in water? Okay, so we have these possibilities. Okay, let's see, is that it? No, there's another one. Okay, we can throw sodium out right now, correct? Because a cation and a cation are not going to interact to form any compounds. So E can't possibly be right. So what we want to do is take lead and look at lead, go across the top of your solubility chart, find lead, and then drop down until you find sulf the sulf um, sulfide ion, the chloride ion, the nitrate ion, the sulfate ion, and see which one, uh, which ones are soluble, right? As it turns out, the nitrate is the only one that's soluble out of those top four. Lead sulfide, lead chloride, lead sulfate are all insoluble. And that's from the chart. Okay, <clears throat> here's a case where we have a word problem and it gives you the name of the compound, but it doesn't give you the formula. So when we were uh, learning how to write chemical formulas and how to name compounds, that was extremely important for you to master. If you haven't mastered it, then this is going to give you trouble. Like I said early on in the course, 
if you don't learn this stuff, learn this type of thing, then it's going to come back to bite you. Sodium phosphate. Sodium phosphate is a polyatomic ion. So the charges are plus one here and three minuses there. Okay, so we need three here, three pluses to balance three minuses. Right, and this this is in solution. It's an aqueous solution. So what's the other compound? Lead to nitrate. Lead. Oops, that's palladium. Lead with a two plus charge because. The name of the compound tells you what the charge is. And then nitrate. And so we need two of these. All right? Now we have our compounds. Our reactants are written correctly. Okay. What precipitate will form, if any? Well, we just swap out these. Right? Put the lead phosphate over here. And it's still two plus. And a phosphate is still three minus. And then sodium and nitrate. Sodium, nitrate, minus one plus one. That's good like that. We look up sodium nitrate and find it's soluble. This is aqueous solution. But this one, written correctly, should have a three over here and a two over there. We look it up in our solubility chart, we find that lead two, lead two plus ion and phosphate, when they run together, are grayed out. This is a solid. It will precipitate out of solution. Right? So there's your precipitate. <clears throat> All right. Okay. Next problem. Consider a solution with the following ions present. All right. What's the question? When all are allowed to react, and there are plenty of them, how many different solids will form? All right. So the way we approach this one is to set up a grid. Right. Our solubility chart had the cations across the top. So let's do that. So we've got lead, two plus across the top. The next cation is potassium. The next one is, that's it. Oh, silver, excuse me, uh, silver. Okay, so now we have Okay. Now for our anions, nitrate. Right. Next, chloride. Next, sulfate. Okay. And next, phosphate. Okay, so you, you take your solubility chart. And you say, what do you get when you combine this one with nitrate? So you find nitrate at the top here and you go across and notice all the squares are clear. All nitrates are soluble. So this is soluble. Uh, let's write AQ for soluble. Aqueous solution. Okay. How about chloride? Well, we find chloride, and we move across here, and we find, let's see, silver chloride is not soluble. So this one forms a solid. Potassium chloride is soluble. And lead 2 plus, let's find it. Okay. It also forms a solid. Okay. And then we go down to sulfate. Follow sulfate across until we find what? Uh, let's see, calcium, barium, 
silver. This one is a solid. And then we keep going across to mercury. We don't have mercury there. Lead 2 plus. This is a solid. This is aqueous. What you'll also notice is if you if you look at potassium here, follow it all the way down, everything is soluble. So all the potassiums are soluble. Just like all the nitrates are soluble. And then what do we have left? We have phosphate. So we go down to phosphate and find that the only soluble compound in here of phosphate is sodium, potassium, and ammonium. All right, so this one is going to be solid. This one's going to be solid. So there's your grid. How many different solids? Let's see. There's one, two, three, four, five, six. I say there are six solids. All right, and there they are. You should find them here. In this position, there, 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 there. Those are the six solids. Oh, um, we didn't actually write the solids. So let's do that. Let's see. This one would be lead 2 plus and sulfate 2 minus. That's it. How about lead and chloride? Well, lead 2 plus and chloride is only a 1 minus. So we need, we need two of those. Uh, lead phosphate and three over here and a two over there and then let's move over here to the silvers okay. silver chloride silver and sulfate silver has a one plus charge so that's two of those for the sulfates two minus and then the last one silver we need three of those or the phosphate. So those are your solids. All right. Okay. Now, there are three ways that you can express uh, a chemical reaction for precipitation. The first way is what we call the molecular equation, or uh, I think a, more, a proper name would be the formula equation, because uh, these are ionic compounds. They don't form molecules. But your, your uh, authors, the authors of your textbook, call it molecular equation. And as long as we understand that they're not really molecules, they're actually formulas, the formula equation for, for this reaction that we looked at earlier, where we had uh, potassium, let's write it way up here, um, potassium chromate, aqueous plus barium nitrate aqueous yield. Let's put the solid first. Barium Chromate, solid, and then potassium nitrate, aqueous. And then we need to balance it. All right, so we need two of these here to give you two potassiums, two nitrates, one barium, one chromate. So this is the, the formula equation. Okay. And it's very useful for, uh, for describing the chemical reaction, as long as we understand that when they're in aqueous solution, we don't actually have those compounds united. They're in separate ions. But it's helpful for stoichiometric purposes when we're trying to determine when we put in so much here, so much here, we we can predict how much comes out here, then the stoichiometry works very well with the formula equation. So the next type is the complete ionic equation.
For that, you take the balanced formula equation and you separate out the ions. Right? We have two potassium ions here in aqueous solution. We have one chromate uh, with a two minus charge in aqueous solution. We have a barium ion in aqueous solution. And we have two nitrate ions in aqueous solution. Now that solid is intact. It does not dissociate. Right? So we write it just as is. Barium chromate solid. And then we have two potassium ions in aqueous solution and two nitrate ions in aqueous solution. That's the complete ionic equation. That's everything that is in your reaction vessel, whether it's in solution or it's a solid uh, falling out of solution. Right? These are considered strong electrolytes, right? Because uh, let's see. Well, after the reaction, the only the electrolytes you have left are potassium and nitrate because the barium and the chromate have been used up. Okay, notice also that these two potassiums are the same on both sides, and these two nitrates are the same on both sides. So what we can do is reduce the complexity of the reaction to just those players that are actually driving the reaction. Because these stay in solution, potassium and nitrate stay in solution, they're not causing the reaction to do anything. They're what's known as spectators. This is a spectator. This is a spectator. Now, they're necessary because you can't have an anion with a cation or a cation without an anion. So they're necessary. But as far as describing the chemical reaction, what's driving it, we don't need them. So if we cross them out, right, same terms on both sides, cancel one another, then what we get is the net ionic equation. So what we have left is chromate, oops, my mistake. That's not a two. So we put chromate in solution. We put barium in solution. And what do we get? We get the solid, barium chromate. That's the net ionic equation. Okay. Now, <clears throat> as a practical matter, <coughs> as a practical matter, if I go into my uh, chemical storeroom and I want to conduct this reaction, um, Let's see, let me check something before I, before I speak. Uh, barium. Yeah, that works. Suppose I don't have barium nitrate. I don't have barium nitrate in my storage. I do have barium chloride. Barium chloride is soluble. And that will give me barium. Okay. Uh, how about chromate? Well, let's see, chromate. Not too many possibilities here. Suppose I don't have potassium chromate, but I have sodium chromate, which is also soluble and gives me the chromate ion. Then I can conduct this reaction. It will work just as well 
as potassium and nitrate, the sodium and chloride will work just as well and produce this reaction in the same product. <clears throat> All right. Okay, let's see what else we got going right here with this concept check. Write the correct molecular equation, com uh, complete ionic equation, and net ionic equation for the reaction between cobalt 2 chloride. Cobalt with a 2 plus. Chloride is 1 minus. So that means we need 2 here. And we don't need to include the charges. Let's fix that. Cobalt 2 chloride in aqueous solution. Let me just check. Cobalt 2 chloride. Yes, it is soluble. Well, that's in solution. And we're going to add to that a solution of sodium hydroxide. Hydroxide, which is also soluble. Then we say, all right. In solution, these ions are all in there mixed together. So that means sodium can interact with chloride. Right? Is that soluble? Oh, yeah, <laughs> table salt. How about cobalt and hydroxide? Hydroxide is a minus one, cobalt a two plus. So that means we need two of these. Well, let's look it up. Let's see, is that soluble? All right, find cobalt right here. Go down to hydroxide. Nope, insoluble. Forms a solid. Okay. Now we need to balance the equation. All right. You can use the uh, budget method if you'd like. These uh, double, um, double uh, replacement reactions these precipitation reactions are usually fairly well behaved. So we say we've got one cobalt, one cobalt. We have two hydroxides. We need two hydroxides here. That means we need two sodiums here. And that gives us two chlorides there. So it's balanced now. This is the um, molecular equation or the formula equation. All right, let's see. That should be it right there. Yes, okay. Next, we want to separate the ions that are in solution. So we have cobalt with a two plus charge and we have two chloride ions um, like that. Then we have two sodium ions and then we have two hydroxyl ions. And then we have our precipitate, which holds together, plus two sodium ions and two chloride ions. That. Okay, so that's our complete ionic equation. There we go. All right. So and now we need the net ionic equation. Now, you have to do this in this sequence in order to get it right. You need the formula equation and balance it. Then you break it apart into ions, and then you look for common ions on both sides. So we have chlorides here, we have two chlorides over there. We have two sodiums here, we have two sodiums over here. Those are our spectators. Now we can write the net ionic equation. 
This is what actually drives the reaction. Plus two hydroxyls yields cobalt two hydroxide solid. Okay. There it is. All right. Now, we're going to talk about a different reaction. Talk about acids and bases. We've learned how to name acids and bases already in a previous chapter on nomenclature. Now we're going to react them together. Um, and we're going to focus on um, the Arrhenius definition of an acid and base. For now. And just, um, just memorize it. An Arrhenius acid has a proton. And I'll use the example there, their first example there. HCl. When you put that in solution, this aqueous solution, it produces hydrogen ions and chloride ions. That's where the acid effect comes from, right? If you taste an acid, um, you wouldn't want to taste this one, but if you taste uh, lemon juice, which is acidic, it's sour. This is where the sour taste comes from, those hydrogen ions. And we can do this for any of the acids. They start with a hydrogen. And we get, um, for this one, you get one hydrogen plus what's left over. The point here is that Whenever uh, an acid releases a hydrogen ion, sometimes I refer to them as protons because what's a hydrogen atom? It's got one proton, one electron. If you take the electron away, you've got nothing left but a proton for most of them. But what happens when you put them in solution is they lose protons one at a time. So this one will, will lose a a proton to go to that. And then uh, this is a strong acid. This is a strong acid. In other words, this complete dissociation goes all the way to that side. But this one, the second proton, let's see. The second proton is weak, right? It does not go all the way this direction. It stays this way, mostly. But it still produces a significant number of ions that will um, conduct electricity through an aqueous solution. Right? There's our example of, of hydrogen chloride. Right? If we write it this way, It's a gas, and that's hydrogen chloride. But if we put it in aqueous solution, remember, aqueous solution, that's hydrochloric acid. So this hydrochloric acid completely dissociates into hydrogen ions, chloride ions in solution. It is a strong electrolyte. Now, the Arrhenius base has within its structure, within the molecule, a hydroxyl ion. There's your example. And when, when it goes into solution, it produces sodium ions and hydroxyl ions. 
and it is a strong base. So the reaction is complete. The dissolution is complete to the right-hand side. Uh, potassium hydroxide, similarly. All right. These are the most common examples of strong bases. There are others. Now, when we put them together, what happens? Let's use an example. Let's say we want to react an acid and a base. So let's choose this acid and this base. What are they going to produce? Well, think of it as a double replacement, right? You swap this part with that part. Let's bring it over here like that. So sodium and chloride combine. Salt, they're completely soluble. What's left over? HOH. That is water. All right. And this is a salt. It doesn't have to be table salt. It doesn't have to be sodium chloride. The consequence, the products of an acid-base reaction will always be a salt, a combination of the cation and the anion from your acid and base, and water. So the net ionic equation, since let's write the complete ionic equation. You've got hydrogen ions, protons, chloride ions, sodium ions, and hydroxyl ions yield water, liquid, and sodium ions plus chloride ions. That would be the complete ionic equation. Well, we know how to cancel. Cancel that one and that one with this one and this one. That means the net ionic equation for an acid-base reaction is hydrogen ions plus hydroxyl ions yields water. That's the net ionic equation for all acid-base reactions. Okay, these are common strong acids and, and uh, uh, acids in aqueous solution. Hydrochloric acid, nitric acid, sulfuric acid. Strong bases. Uh, oh, wait a minute, excuse me. A strong acid is a substance that completely dissociates in water into hydrogen ions and anions. Uh, for sulfuric acid, that's true for the first hydrogen. Strong bases are metal hydroxides. And the strong bases are formed from alkaline metals and alkaline earths. Uh, combined with hydroxyls. So we've we've looked at sodium and potassium, but um, lithium, rubidium, alkali metals, um, magnesium, calcium, strontium, hydroxide, those are also strong bases. Uh, okay, this is the chemical definition of a salt. It is the one of the products of an acid-base reaction is always a salt, and not necessarily table salt. Okay, uh, that's nothing new. Okay, let's try the net. Oh. <laughs> The net ionic equation for the reaction of nitric acid and lithium hydroxide is the same as always. There it is right there. Hydrogen ions plus hydroxyls yields water. That's the net ionic equation for an acid-base reaction. All right. <clears throat> 
Uh, let's move on to the next one. Oxidation reduction reactions. Oops. That's not going to work. Oxidation reduction reactions. We need to define what oxidation and what reduction are. Okay. So let me see. Uh, check my hard copy. <laughs> okay, it's not given. All right. I'm going to add something to the slides that's not there, but it'll help you understand what oxidation reduction reaction is. First of all, there must be a transfer of electrons, one or more transfer of electrons from one species to another, one atom to another. And that's what this illustration is showing. Magnesium, in this case, is transferring electron, two electrons to oxygen. And the other magnesium is two more electrons to oxygen. And what that does is, if, if that's neutral, right? And let's say, how many protons does it have? 12, 12 protons. If it's neutral, it also has 12 electrons, correct? 12 protons, 12 electrons. If we transfer two of those electrons to another atom, like oxygen in this case, right? Now we have 10 electrons. So what's the net charge? Well, 10 electrons and 12 protons means that there's an excess of two protons. So that's a two plus charge. All right. And by the same token, the oxygen is going to pick up those two electrons. Now it's an excess of two negatives. Its charge is going to be two minus. And then when that happens, those two attract one another purely electrostatically. Positives attract negatives. Okay. As far as oxidation reduction goes, the definition of the two uh, is, I've got a, a mnemonic device. It's called oil rig. Okay. Oxidation is loss of electrons. Reduction is gain of electrons. Oil rig. So oxidation says that something is losing electrons. Reduction says something is gaining electrons. And they always occur together, never separately. That's why we put them together in the name, right? They're, they always happen together. If something is oxidized, something else has to be reduced because we don't have free electrons floating around. Um, this is also abbreviated as redox reactions. It's another way of saying it. Now, these reactions always occur between, well, no, that's not right. They can occur between metals and nonmetals. And the reactions between nonmetals and metals are always oxidation reduction. Okay? But transfer of electrons can occur between two nonmetals. It's just that um, it doesn't always occur that way. If you have a, a pure metal and a pure nonmetal, if they react, then there's going to be a transfer of electrons. All right. Okay, if we write it, if we write this equation uh, out in our uh, equation format, we have aluminum. Let's see. Yeah, aluminum 
and Fe2O3, aluminum metal, and Fe2O3 compound. This is a solid. If we transfer electrons from aluminum to iron, transfer electrons from aluminum to iron, then we will get aluminum oxide plus iron metal. <clears throat> okay, look at it this way. This aluminum starts out neutral, but this iron is actually three plus, and oxygen is two minus. Over here, this is two minus, and this is three plus. So we need a two here and a three there. Right? And this is zero. So what has happened? Well, for each aluminum, we transferred three electrons, but we needed two. Right? Three electrons for this will balance that three electrons for one of them, not both. So we need two of these to transfer six electrons. And now two times three is six plus, two times three minus is six minus. They balance each other. And we need two ions. Okay, so that's your balanced equation. We've transferred electrons. I like to write it like this. Aluminum has lost three electrons per aluminum times two equals six electrons lost. Okay? So aluminum has been oxidized. And that means iron has been reduced. Oh, excuse me. Excellent, right? We're going from this aluminum to this aluminum. And in the process, they, these two aluminums have lost six electrons to give you those two aluminums with a three plus charge each. So this one means if that one's a loss, this one has to be a gain. Right? So we've gained three electrons per iron atom times two of them equals six electrons gain. Okay? Notice that the electrons lost, the total number of electrons lost must equal the total number of electrons gained. Otherwise, your equation is not balanced. All right. By the way, this reaction is used, well, it's very, it's a violent reaction. This is called thermite. Aluminum metal and iron, uh, iron three oxide will produce pure iron. And the, um, the, the uh, railroad industry uses this reaction to fuse rails together. Rather than bolt them together with a gap, uh, if they if they can fuse them together and produce um, out of a special type of steel that doesn't expand and contract with temperature very much, you can you can fuse rails together for a mile or two long, and they will employ this reaction to fuse those rail ends together, and then once the reaction is complete, they'll clean it off and grind it down, and the joint is actually stronger than the rail itself. All right. We, when a metal and a non-metal react, we always assume it's oxidation reduction, an electron transfer. Two non-metals can also undergo this reaction. At this point, we have to recognize um, the cause. And very often we look for oxygen as a reactant or a product. Not always, but very often oxygen is, is involved when two nonmetals react. And the compound form is not ionic, it's covalent. All right. 
These have been our driving forces. We've talked about all these down to transfer of electrons except for formation of a gas. Um, let's see, we classified this one. Is, is this a repeated? That's a precipitation reaction, yeah. It's also double displacement or double replacement. I mentioned that earlier also. Okay. Acid base reactions where hydrogen ion is uh, transferred and it reacts with a hydroxyl to produce water. That's the driving force for acid base reactions is the formation of water. This reaction is is driven way, way, way to the right toward water. Okay. Uh, transfer of electrons. Here's an example, lithium and fluorine, metal, non-metal. This is a very, very violent reaction. Now, the formation of a gas is our next topic. Gases can be formed in many ways. This is one of them, where you have a, an acid, hydrochloric acid, and a reactive metal, zinc. Then you get uh, this reaction. Let me write it up here so I can talk about it. Zinc solid plus hydrochloric acid in solution will replace hydrogen with zinc. So now we have zinc chloride. And this should be two here in solution, plus hydrogen gas. Okay. And uh, we need to balance it. So we need two of these here. Yeah. That will balance the equation. Notice also what has happened here. Right? Zinc is neutral here. Right? Over here, it's a two plus charge. So what happened to it? <laughs> well, what happened to it was zinc had a loss of two electrons, two electrons per zinc atom. That means somebody had to gain electrons and that was hydrogen. Right? That's neutral. This one is a plus one charge. So that means we had to have a gain of one electron per hydrogen times two equals two electrons. And this is times one equals two electrons. Okay. This leads me to give you a clue. How do you tell? What's well, a quick way to tell if you have an oxidation reduction reaction? I mean, it's not always the case, but in many cases, this is true. When you have an element on one side and it ends up in a compound on the other side, that's an oxidation reduction reaction. Or if you have an element on a compound on this side and the product produces an element on that side, then you have an oxidation reduction. It's often viewed as a single replacement reaction in this case. Okay, what's a combustion reaction? Well, a combustion reaction is a special kind of oxidation reduction. Look at this flow chart. Oxidation reduction here, combustion is a subset. Required for a combustion reaction is always elemental oxygen. So let's use uh, methane gas plus oxygen gas yields, always yields carbon dioxide and water, okay? We can tell this is an oxidation reduction reaction because there's an element 
and it's in compounds on this side. So we know that's oxidation reduction. But it's a special case of oxidation reduction because of oxygen. It's a combustion reaction. And it always generates lots of heat. Right? There's our example. Right? If we put a two here and a two over here, we have a balanced equation. All right. <clears throat> there are other types of reactions. And when we when we give you these uh, types of reactions, a single reaction can be classified under multiple headings. Right? Just like this is an oxidation reduction reaction, it's also a combustion reaction. Right? So this synthesis or combination reaction is one in which you take simple materials and make a complex material. Most often you have uh, two elements make a compound. That's a synthesis or a combination reaction. Notice also that it's an oxidation reduction reaction. You got an element makes a compound. Element makes a compound. That's an oxidation reduction reaction. A decomposition is that reaction in reverse. Where we take complex and break it down into simple. So we've gone from water down to hydrogen gas and oxygen gas. That's an oxidation reduction reaction also. So this flow chart takes everything we've learned so far and classifies them. Uh, yeah. All right. Hydrogen and oxygen. The reaction between hydrogen and oxygen to form water is this reaction, right? That's the same reaction that powered the space shuttle, right? Liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen were contained in that big orange tank in separate parts of the tank. And in the engines, the main engines of the space shuttle, hydrogen is uh, taken, is turned into a gas from a liquid and oxygen turned into a gas from a from liquid. It combined in the engine and releases lots of energy and helps drive the shuttle into space. So this can be classified as uh, a combination reaction or an oxidation reduction reaction. It's also a combustion. Notice there's oxygen there. So it's oxidation reduction, a synthesis or a combination reaction, and combustion. It's all three. All right. So that's it for chapter seven. Um, be sure and try to work as many problems as you can in the review document. And a week from today, I'll return for review. Um, and I'll repeat, next Thursday, this coming Thursday, the 22nd of February, I will not be Zooming this lesson. I'll be occupied with uh, mandatory training. That's it.